this. It's going to be on Iron Geek's website, which is the most popular website in the community. So, what? The most. The most. The most. So, um, this microphone is for the recording, not for people to be able to hear you. So, just realize that. Cool. You ready? All right. Uh, what I'd like to do is just take a moment to thank some of our sponsors. Obviously, we couldn't have done this without them. Uh, they are the National Security Agency, Exabee, Accenture Federal Services, Open Security, Titanium Level, CyberSec Jobs, <laughs> Denim Group, uh, Alamo ISSA, and Land uh, Landmark Solutions. So without further ado, so thank you everyone for coming to this morning's panel that is recruiters. So uh, for those of you who were in my presentation earlier, I really highly recommend that you network with recruiters, you network with people within companies, because you never know when you're going to need to find your next job. And what's interesting is that we have networks of people who help us get our, you know, vacations, where we hang out, where we get the most, you know, recent technical information, but very few of us actually have a network of recruiters that we work with. And recruiters are going to be the people that are going to be their, your ambassadors or your advocates advocates going into any company. So you want to make sure that you have a network of recruiters. The challenge that I am finding in this community is that we rely on all of the negativity that people are sharing about recruiters. There are several Twitter handles out there that are called Shit Recruiters Say, and they actually embarrass other recruiters by posting sort of their outreach, any of the LinkedIn messages that are out there. So we have a lot of negativity out there talking about recruiters. So one of the things that I have been doing over the last several years is bringing recruiters that I know in the community to come and present and talk with the community and share with them what's going on the other side of the terminal or what's going on behind the curtain. Because a lot of us get frustrated when we're trying to apply for a job. The challenge is, is that we don't know who to ask the questions for. And so one of the reasons why we have a recruiter panel is so for recruiters to actually share what goes on in their companies. So I'm going to have each one of the panelists introduce themselves, sort of talk about their recruiting or what they do as far as the recruiting process, a little bit about their company, and I'd like you to share at least one thing that not many people know about yourselves. So first, Michael. Well, first, thanks for thanks for having me. So about myself, I I am retired Army. I my last, uh, 20 years in the Army, my last seven, eight, almost eight years in the Army. I managed recruiters, managed recruiting stations for the Army. Retired in 2013, and I started recruiting um, for a recruiting agency here in San Antonio as a, as a tech recruiter. And before I became a tech recruiter, I could barely, don't have to plug a computer in. Um, it was kind of a crash course into the IT field, and, and then we're going to make you a tech recruiter. Um, I, in the agency world, the, the the more senior you progress throughout your career, the more it becomes about business development and less about recruiting, less about HR. And my passion was uh, the recruiting, the, the human resources portion of it. And I actually found a passion for the IT industry. So I was in the agency world for about three years, and I left, and I went over to a company called DTSI. So what's DTSI? DTSI is, is an acronym. It's Diversified Technical Services Incorporated. We are an IT company who provides IT services to the United States military. Uh, we, our corporate headquarters is here in San Antonio, Texas, as well as a good portion of our employees. We do have offices throughout the country. Uh, we roughly employ a little over 150 people. Um, it's good times for DTSI because in, in this industry, you have two types of companies. You have large companies, you have small companies. So since 1980, DTSI has been a small company. Uh, the threshold is not the amount of employees that you employ. It's the amount of revenue that you bring in, uh, maintained over a certain amount of time frame. And next year, DTSI will be considered a large company. Uh, so we're going to be doing a lot of hiring to maintain that large status. And now we have to compete with the big boys. Um, one of them she mentioned, Lockheed Martin. That would be a, that would now would be a competitor of DTSI. Uh, so it's good times. Uh, what people don't know about me, I, I guess I grew up in Nebraska. I love Nebraska football. I'll go Huskers. So. <laughs> <laughs> Great, Bill. 
Do you want us to stand? Oh, come on, you can stand. <laughs> okay. My name is Bill Brandstetter. This is my, I don't know, fourth fourth yeah. time doing B-sides. Uh, I am also an Army guy. Got out back in 2005, and uh, a guy I knew said, hey, I just started a company called Abacus Solutions Group. Why don't you come and be a recruiter? And I was a medical guy in the Army. I'm like, I don't know anything about recruiting. He said, don't worry, I'll train you. So 14 years later, here I am. Uh, I've seen the company grow from three guys sitting around a, a cubicle, typical startup environment, playing pranks on each other, little remote control cars in the office. Uh, to We have about the same, about 150-something employees all over the country. Uh, and so I recruit almost exclusively IT professionals for us. We do everything from cyber, net ops, a uh, little bit of software, a little bit of medical stuff and some training. Uh, but that's, that's what we do. Um, I was trying to think of a little known fact. I, my wife and I spent all of our money on travel. Uh, we just were, especially getting out of the country, been to 50 something countries. Um, that's what I love to do. Okay. My name is, uh, Gregory Rivas. I, um, I'm not a recruiter. I, uh, I'm actually a, a tech screener. So I, I work as a, uh, uh, as a SOC lead over at, uh, Defense Point Security down the road. Um, got into that um, basically in college as a psychology major, didn't know where I wanted to go. And so naturally I enlisted. <laughs> uh, spent a little bit of uh, a time in the Air Force. I'm still a reservist. And I, um, yeah, hey, I know them. I, uh, yeah, uh, still still in the reserves. Uh, said this, uh, came, back, went, came back to school, finished my four-year my four year degree in psychology. Uh, and then s spend the rest of my time doing cybersecurity things. Um, so uh, once you make it past them, you got to make it past me. <laughs> so what's interesting is that there's some memes out there that say what a, the typical day of a recruiter is basically with their feet up on a desk and, you know, reaching all kinds of cat memes and stuff. So... I was hoping that our first two panelists can sort of talk about what your typical day is as far as looking at for candidates or recruiting. And then, Greg, if you can just sort of tell how you incorporate the tech screening in amongst all of the other things that you do. So, First, what's a typical day like for you? <laughs> there is no typical day in recruiting. <laughs> um, the So my, my portion, my job is I think I'm the middleman between – the hiring teams and the candidates. And my job is to, to bring candidates into the process and then tell the hiring team why they should hire them. And so when I, when I come into work this, in the morning, I, I, I check my email and I'm getting emails from candidates. I'm getting emails from both the candidates and the hiring managers. I, I answer those emails and then I see who who is in what stage and what in what process and how can we progress those people? And that's the good portion of my morning. Um, somewhere, somehow, I got to actually find time to recruit and actually reach out to people. Um, there are days where I, I do, I do, I as a recruiter do a lot of traveling. Uh, earlier in the week, when when Kathy reached out to me to come here, I was actually in Huntsville, Alabama, at the National Cybersecurity Summit. Um, there, I'm not complaining because it's actually one thing I enjoy about recruiting because nothing. Is no day is ever the same in recruiting, um, and that's kind of like what I like is walk to the door and see see what what battles I got to fight. Um, but it's fun; I enjoy it, and yeah. Bill, typical day for you. You you recruit for a variety of different positions. Yeah, so so a lot of a lot of similarities there. Um, I, I work with two other recruiters. I'm a recruiting manager, <clears throat> so we have a a daily call where we sync up and say, "What are you working on today?" How did it go yesterday? Um, and then typically I'll spend the morning, what I call moving the ball forward on our open recs. So contacting hiring managers, contacting candidates, following up on interviews that happen, trying to schedule new interviews. Um, I'll go and look and see who applied for our, our open recs and our applicant tracking system. Um, if I can find time, because again, there's no, no typical day, as he said. Um, I'll actually go and do some headhunting getting on Monster, Dice, Career Builder, Indeed, LinkedIn, uh, any any number of our tools and actually trying to find people and reaching out to them. Um, but then I'm also supporting our business development team because they'll say, hey, we're, we're trying to 
uh, write this proposal for solicitation. We need to know how much pen testers cost in Colorado Springs. So I'm having to go do some compensation uh, analysis for that. I might have to find some, some resumes for a proposal for key personnel. Uh, I don't travel as much. We don't really uh, do a lot of big career fairs just because we don't have large groups of people at any one location. Um, so I work from home, which is awesome. Love the commute. Great. What, with the, the tech screening that you do, how does that fit in with your regular day? Um, so my, my regular day is going to consist of um, you know training younger analysts, uh, responding to alerts, doing all the fun things that are involved in a SOC. Um, what, where the tech screen fits in is we, we, we go and the leads get together and we sit down in a panel of two to three, depending on the day and availability, and, and try our best to see if, um, not only if the person's a good fit, but if, um, you know, um, you know, what, 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 what kind of, what, what kind of knowledge that they come, that they, that they bring to the table. Um, and that, that can vary pretty, pretty widely. Um, and, and we're, we're and that's okay, but if you but if you have a, a sort of a more detailed background in, in security, we're gonna expect more detailed answers um, from you. So it, it's sort of like a on a sliding scale depending on the position you want. So, so I'm gonna build upon that and let's talk about what are some of the things that people really mess up in the process. So Greg, I'm gonna talk with you first about in the tech screening process. What are some of the one or two things that people mess up mo most often? Uh, it's a couple of things actually. Nerves, um, you gotta calm down, man. Um, I know it's really kind of nerve wracking to do these interviews. Just. Just take a deep breath. <laughs> Breathing control is really important with that. Um, the second thing is, um, if you say that you're, you know, well, you're, well, I really am into, you know, current affairs and I mean, cybersecurity, I really do this and that, and I ask you what Blue Keep is, and some of you may or may not know what that is, um, you should know what that is. Uh, in, in this case, Blue Keep is a vulnerability that came out two weeks ago for affecting RDP that allows people to trivially compromise other computers. Um, very, very critical, very loud. Um, so if you, if you, if you ask, if you, if you talk about, well, I keep up with current trends and you aren't up in current trends, that, that's sort of like a big ding. Uh, another thing would be home labs. Um, demonstrate your passion by, by doing something at home. That's, that's going to put the technical people at much more at ease if we, if we know that he messes with raspberry pies in his free time. That's value. So. Yeah. I'm going to have to say, communication um, both both from a uh, where are you at in the process but um, if you're not going to be available um, letting me know I mean that, that's just one of my things that if if you email me I'm gonna get back to you within 24 hours and if it's gonna take me longer than 24 hours to get you the answer that you're looking for I'm at least gonna say let me get back to you but I'll, I'll email candidates and then I won't hear something back for three or four days. And I'm interpreting that as they're not really interested in my job. Maybe they're going for something else. Uh, but I'm, at that point, I'm not considering them to be uh, a serious candidate. And that, I'd say the other piece of that is, is ghosting. Um, that's when a candidate just stops responding to emails or phone calls. Um, I know that's a growing trend. I would advise you not to do it um, even even if that's acceptable some places um, I if I have somebody ghost me if I'm talking about a job they're interested they're interviewing all of a sudden they just disappear um, I, I had it happen recently where that happened to me and um, a guy followed up with me later and he said hey I'm interested in this other job that you have posted and I said hey when we were talking six months ago you just disappeared on me um, that's that's not going to be a good fit for our company. So it, it can come back to bite you. So if you're not interested or if you get another job, just say, not interested anymore, thanks. It doesn't have to be complicated. So I, I am going to second on communication. Uh, a few years ago, there was a word that was not in my vocabulary that is on the top of my mind every day, and that is succinct. Um, when people... When people get nervous, people tend to ramble on. 
Uh, when I was an, I remember when I was an agency recruiter, I had a candidate who was pheno technically phenomenal, did great things for a lot of great companies, and I was sure that this candidate would have got the job. He went to go interview with the, that company's recruiter, and he he rambled on for must. He, the recruiter said, "I set my clock to one of the questions. It was 15 minutes." He just kept on talking, and I tried to stop him, but he just kept on rolling with it. So tell that candidate to be succinct. I, like I said, it was that word was not in my vocabulary. I had to go look it up. Be short with your communications. When you when you answer a question during the interview, keep it to one or two minutes. Uh, we're all human beings. We all get nervous. Uh, my wife is a good example. When she gets nervous, she just. Um, <laughs> this is being recorded. Yeah. Oh well, she ain't gonna see it. <laughs> she's she's not the edge. Well, you know, what? tell the truth. She'd agree with me because I often tell her, "Baby, you did doing it." Uh. <laughs> Um, yeah, just keep it, it, the way to get around that is practice and repetition. Practice makes perfect, right? So practice your interviews with, with a, with a friend, with a significant other before you go on a real interview and, and practice keeping your answers succinct. So let's turn this to the positive. What are one to three things that a job seeker has done that has made a positive impact on you? Or what are some of the things that you think a you know, ca candidate should do to really have a positive impact on their overall process? Bill? I think tailoring the resume is, is always a big one because we, we can tell when somebody's just sending their resume out to every single job that they find on there. Uh, but I can also tell when someone tailors it, especially if they put in the objective statement somewhere, I'm looking for a cybersecurity job with Abacus Solutions Group. I know they've taken the time to uh, to tailor it and to send it to me. I'm, I'm automatically considering them to be a stronger candidate. Um, hand in hand with that is, is a simple follow-up. Um, just because of my thing, I got to respond to candidates that email me. If somebody applies for a job and then emails me like a day later, I'm going to bump them up to the top of my list of, okay, I really need to go look at their resume. I need to consider them as a candidate. So it's such a simple thing. It takes a minute of your time to send a follow-up email, but it makes a huge impression on me. Michael. So one thing that I would say would be, I do agree 100% with what he just said, but one thing I would add to it would be after the interview, the act of thanking that interviewer seems to be a lost art. It is, it is a rarity that, that I get an email, hey Michael, thanks for, thanks for setting up that interview. Uh, please, please forward this thank you letter on to, uh, the, the interviewer. I would say I get an email like that, one out of every 50 interviews, and the people that do it, Set, set you up, set you apart from the rest that don't. Um, and, or, and to go one step above, maybe the day after the interview, actually stop by the front office and drop off a thank you card. You can go, you can go to, you know, Walmart and buy a box of thank you cards for what, $2? Um, the day after the interview, sign it. The day after the interview, drop it off the receptionist. Hey, give this to James. I just talked to him yesterday. Um, one in maybe 500 would do that literally i'm not making it's it's crazy um yeah gregory anything positive that people do that you think they should do um we had a made a lady come in and she had completed like five hack the box challenges um which is like not an easy thing was able to talk us through it and that that's going to set you apart, is, is at least from the, on the tech side, is your extracurricular activities, you know, what you're doing in the free time. Um, we uh, had another person that had just like a military guy that had really unusually detailed process, that was able to say the unusually detailed process of breaking into a, a, a corporation as a part of a red team. Three really, really clear and succinct processes that that you can take and, and, and um, in security world, knowledge of, 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 of the offensive side of things is is pretty that's that's gonna that that's but that's really nice to have it's it's nice to be able to think like an attacker and then be able to to, to demonstrate how you would defend against those attacks in the interview in fact that's one of my questions i'll ask i'll ask you is what you know how, what are some ways we can defend against these things and the best way to get that is to yeah just, just participate in online websites and and um 
complete challenges and, 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 and do attend conferences, you know, things like that. Yes. So one thing that Greg Gregory said was competitions, and we talked about that in the earlier presentation, which is competitions are a you know a, an instance where you have a short time frame, you have short resources, you are working with a team you've never worked with before, and you are going up against an adversary you have never gone up against before. What does that sound like? That's work experience. So if you're not looking at competitions as work experience, you're really shortchanging yourself. So any time that you are part of a competition, be it on-site or online, take some time after the competition to actually write out what happened. You know, what was the goal? Where did you fail? Where, what did you learn? Because what's interesting is that a lot of people will ask you during the interview process, Tell us something that you failed at and what you learned. Well, a lot of us are not going to want to say that we failed at work, you know, that the servers all went down or something like that. But if you have an instance in a competition where you failed at something and you learned something, that is great fodder for your communications during your interviews. So definitely look at your competitions as a way of learning work experience, but also do yourself the favor of writing down what you learned, what the process was, and also what what are the, the other non-technical things that happen for you during the competition? What did you have to do? Did you have to learn how to communicate differently? Did you have to take a leadership position? Did somebody drop their pack and you had to pick up after that? So a lot of people think that recruiters are the sole decision maker and that, you know, this recruiter is the one that was mean to me and didn't give me the job. And a lot of people don't understand behind the scenes that there is a very long convoluted process. So I was hoping each one of our panelists can sort of go through step by step what is the hiring process, the recruiting process, and what are some of the things that people need to do to make sure they move to the next step. Michael? Well, this is a really complicated question, but I will do my best to answer it. So let me ask the last part of that question first, what can you do to, to move along in that process would be to, to follow up, to follow up with your recruiter. If you're working with a company that's our recruiter, follow up with that recruiter. If you're working with the hiring manager, follow up with that hiring manager. But don't, you know, we, I'm sure we all dated, right? You, you don't, nobody wants to date that, that guy or girl that calls you 20 times a day saying, hey, go out with me, go out with me, go out with me. Who wants to date that person, right? Somebody, um, there's an, so there's an art to it. You want to read that person? <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's an, uh, there's an art to how how often and how much you follow up and what you say when you follow up. No one always be polite, respectful. Number two, I would suggest that the the day after send that that thank you email, that thank you card that I was talking about. Don't do it the same day. Um, there's a, so there's a fine art to it, right? Um, don't be too pushy, but be a little bit pushy. Um, so what is the process? So I, as a recruiter, I don't, I, I don't usually hire anybody. If they're working on my team, I would be involved in that hiring process. But ninety, more than ninety percent of the, the people that 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 I talk to, I don't hire. Um, I have the authority. To, I do have the authority to say say no. You're not a good fit for our company. Um, so the process, the people that are involved are going to be, we have, we're project based companies and our project is with projects. So we're the U.S. military. So our pro program, our project and our program managers and our account executives are, are involved in the hiring process. Um, some of the, some of those people, the candidates may talk to, some of the people the candidates may not talk to, but they're still involved in, on the backside. Um, and HR and also our human resources team gets involved too, and so does our director of operations. Everybody gets involved with the hiring process. Um, it, but the most important part for you as the candidate is what can you do? Would, would be to um, follow up, and, and uh, that would be. Phil. So I I probably have final say in about one out of eight positions. Um, just specific contracts where maybe it's low level and they trust me enough to not screw it up. Um, but the rest of them, uh, if, if it's a prime contract, we have an internal uh, corporate program manager that we always have interview because 
I, I'm putting myself in, in your guys' shoes. You don't just want to talk to a recruiter. You want to talk to somebody that's going to be a supervisor that's, that's able to tell you more than what the recruiter can. Um, if it's a subcontractor, then we're going to have them talk to somebody on site with the prime uh, who's able to answer their technical questions. But that just gives candidates uh, a, a more robust view of the job than what they could get from me. Um, what can you do? I'd say just be responsive. Because uh, remember, we're trying to move the ball forward. We're trying to get these positions filled. And especially if uh, a new security clearance is involved or, or type of background check, all those things can delay the process. And if, if it's taken you two, three days to respond to a request for some documentation, that just slows it down. So uh, I love a candidate that will, when I say, hey, I need you to sign this and send it back, I'm getting it back within 24 hours. That's That makes me happy and the hiring manager as well. So our, I guess uh, for us, it's um, we sit on a panel, and the, the ultimate the ultimate decision is, is 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 made by consensus. We all talk about the analyst strengths, weaknesses. Um, the fundamental question is: is it is it worth training this person uh, to work here? That's 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 what it comes down to. Um, the less we have to train you, the more likely we're going to hire you. That's it's just basic. It's just basic man hours math. Um, so the more the more skills and the more the more techniques, and interesting things you can bring to the table, that's going to give you the edge. And you don't need necessarily work traditional work experience to to get that stuff. Um, like I said, do challenges that kind of thing. Um, once we make our decision. Uh, the, that, that decision is ultimately, do we want this person on the team? Are we okay with training them? Are we okay with their current technical ability? And then we refer to our manager who will, uh, well, SOC manager, who will uh, sort of speak a little bit more into their personality. And if all of those agree, you, you get hired. That's basically it. Um, the ways to, dif to, to differentiate yourself... Um, yeah, be fluent. Be fluent in in TCP/IP. Be fluent in if you're have a host. If you have a host forensics background, be fluent in that. We can we can push toward that direction. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can you can you can you can you can yeah you can you can you can stand you stand apart. Um, yeah. So I think one thing that we need to understand is that in the recruiting process, the recruiter is not the sole decision maker. And that is something that you want to definitely ask through one of the initial uh, questions, maybe the phone screen. Can you sort of walk me through this process? What happens at this step? What are the different steps I'm going to look for? Because a lot of people think that they apply for a job and then a decision is made. It is not made within a week. It is made over several weeks, correct? Absolutely. So, and you need to understand that there are many different steps to this process. There is applying for the job. There's the phone screen. There's the technical screen. If it's a, a prime or a subcontract, you have to meet with many different program managers. And that, what that also should be telling you is that any time you're considering quitting your job, you are going to have two to three months where you're not going to have a job because you're going through all of the different process. So understand that it's not something you can turn around on a dime. It is something that you're going to have to go through various different steps and various different people to meet. So let's talk about one of the main tools that gets someone in interview. Let's talk about the resume. Now, we have someone here who's going to be doing resume reviews all day today. Um, he was doing one, and I grabbed him. I thank you again for doing that. But one thing that I see a lot in the community is people trying to make their resumes pretty. Okay? We are not a graphics industry. You are not trying to impress everybody by making your resume look pretty. But can each one of our panelists sort of talk about what good things you see on a resume and what drives you nuts on a resume? Michael? So I would say that whatever job you're applying for, make sure that that Make sure you tailor that resume for that job. I'm not saying make stuff up. I'm saying highlight your exp your experience for that job, and and don't talk. Your resume shouldn't have a lot of stuff. It can have a little bit of stuff, but not a lot of stuff about things that do not relate to that job. 
um, directly. You know, there's a lot of soft skills that could relate to any job, so that they should be speaking about. Um, I remember when I was in that agency world and I tried to download a resume and as soon as I hit the download button, my computer froze up. So I went to the, the we had an IT, somebody who worked on the desktops and I said, hey, my computer froze up. What's going on? So about 10 minutes later, he said, wow, you just downloaded a 100 page resume. <laughs> <laughs> There's no need for a 100 page resume ever. <laughs> I'm not even. I'm not even kidding. It was. It was. It was about 100 pages. Um, resume should, should. Resume should only go back seven, ten, ten years, maybe. There's no need to go back any further than that because is is anything that we did in our professional lives ten, ten more than ten years ago relevant to what we do today? Not really. No. Uh. Uh. Um, so they they should be. Uh, that doesn't mean make your font size seven so that whoever reads it has to squint to read it, but it, that gets you within that two, three pages. So the font should be like 10 to 12 times in Roman, something, something really simple. Um, uh, you know, there are, there are three types. If you didn't know, there's three types of resumes, chronological, functional, and a chron like a chrono, chrono combination resume. Um, the most 95, the vast majority of the resumes that I see and my hiring managers see are chronological. A couple, last week, somebody sent in a cross-functional resume. I was like, it's me. I knew what it looked like. I'm a recruiter. I see resumes all day long. I said it looked pretty good to me. I was actually quite impressed. But guess what? I sent it to the hiring team and they were like, this isn't a resume. You need to call him and tell him to make a resume. <laughs> so if you, if you want, so if you do, if you do a cross functional or a functional resume, be prepared to talk about it and talk about why you just did something that the vast majority of the population does not do. Um, so, yeah. So? Yeah, I, I obviously have a lot of strong feelings about resumes. Um, so I would just say, um, I just say, just remember that the resume is not to get you a job, it's to get you an interview. And so you, you just want the resume to say what it needs to say so that somebody like me says, oh, I, I need to call this person and, and have a conversation with them about the job. And then it's in the interview that you're going to get the job. Um, so just a couple of a couple of things, and if you come see me, I'm sitting over there after this. I'll I'll probably tell you the same thing. A lot of our jobs, you have to have certain things in order for us to even consider you. Maybe a clearance or certifications or a degree. So I like to see those things up at the top. If if I have to go digging, um, I miss them. I just it, I'm human. I'm reading stuff fast. I'm looking at 50 resumes in an hour. And I might miss your CompTIA Security Plus because you put it buried in a list of bullets somewhere in the resume. So I like to see clearance, certs, education, maybe your, your major skills up top before you even get to your experience section. Um, I also, I would advise you to stay away from anything subjective. And I'm, I'm talking about you being a results-oriented team player. It's on everybody's resume, and it, I, I'm just telling you, the moment I see those words, my, my eyes go blurry, and I, I can't even read that, pass it, that paragraph anymore. So keep it objective. Talk about your, your highlights, your accomplishments. I'm going to find out if your results are oriented by what your accomplishments say. I'm going to find out if you're a team player in the interview, and I'm asking you how well you worked with others on that project that you talked about. So those things are going to come out, but you rating yourself as a good communicator on the resume, is it's not going to help you. It's just going to distract from what you ought to have there. Those are really, he actually took some of mine. So yeah, so right, right, right off the bat, like if you put those soft things, I, that's like you didn't put anything. Just I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. It's what what is interesting is, oh, I worked with VMware for for you know three years. Like that's quantifiable. Make it quantifiable, and uh, again, like he said, put all that up front, up on top, so that way we can whenever I and whenever we're talking with you, uh, I can just point at my computer screen and say, well, he did this and this and this. 
while you're muted or while you're, you know, talk, explaining an answer. Um, please, I had a guy do this last week. Please don't give me your resume in paragraph form. Oh my God, it's the worst. I I, I want to be able to quickly see what you've done. I don't want to have to read, you know, a hundred words about, you know, Sun Microsystems. I, I that's not gonna. I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I'm gonna ignore it. <laughs> So I'm going to throw you all a curveball, something that is not on the list of questions, uh, mainly because this is the first time we've had a panel and we've all had someone who's, who is a veteran. So I want each one of you to sort of talk to our audience here in Military City or to our video audience, sort of some things that transitioning veterans do on their resume or in their interview process that you think that they shouldn't do and what they should, you know, something positive positive that they can bring to the table. So Greg, I'm going to start with you first. Can you say the question one more time? <laughs> so just give, give one or two pieces of advice to transition veterans, uh, interview process or resume. So put your military experience up top. I don't care that you're that you were a dog handler. It's still relevant. I still like to see the discipline up there. Um, you know, I, I'd like to see just don't don't put your unit, but only. I want to see, OK, well, I, you, I was NCOIC of X. Right, I want to see that right across the top. Um, um, yeah, that's that's something that 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 is interesting to me. We we hire a lot of military guys. That might be because we have a lot of military guys, but and so we think they're great. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, that's 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 something that you know that 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 we'd like to be on the lookout for, especially if you have a military cyber background. Um, you need to you need to make that very relevant to, to even if it was like. You, know, you transferred out of the unit like two, three years ago, right? You PCS somewhere. Um, I want to, I want to know that you were there and and that you were doing that that task because that's really, that's that's really great. Um, that translates very well to my to my particular sector as a, as a as a SOC lead, right? I want to see that you that you've that you have that analytical capability that you that you've brought in and from from the military. Uh, I said, don't don't put your PT score. Uh, don't put your marksmanship score. Don't don't care about your release. Yeah, don't put your Army Achievement Medal. Um, if if you're not out yet, but you're you're going to be getting out, I like to see your availability date because I I got some people that are you know talking to me about jobs and they're not getting out for six months to a year. I'm like, okay, talk to me when you're about two months out. You know, that's, that's too far. So that's helpful. Um, and this, this really goes for everybody, not just veterans, but, um, when you're listing your bullets, you want more than just your responsibilities. I see this a lot on veteran resumes is they just say, this is what I did. This is what I did. This is what I did. Um, but you know, on your, your NCOERs or your OERs or whatever they're called for, yeah, yeah you, you're talking about the awesome things that you did, like your, your accomplishments. And so those are, that's what your resume should read like. It should be very accomplishment heavy. How, how, were you selected first out of, 25 people for something, that's something to put on there, not just that you showed up and didn't get an Article 15 or fired or, or something like that. So talk about your accomplishments. I would say that a job interview is not a promotion board. And don't treat it as such. Don't go in there knocking the door, banging three times, kicking the door down, like, so I'm filing a report for duty, so I'm major. Um, it is, it is a casual conversation for the interviewer to learn about you and for you to, and ends for you to learn about the company. Um, it's, it's an interview goes both ways. Um, so don't, don't be over military bearing during your interview. Uh, just keep it casual because that's what it is. Um, do not put acronyms on your resume. Um, I was in the Army 20 years. The Army has a lot of acronyms. And if somebody was, if it might be seen by a veteran, it might not be seen by a veteran. And the chances of that veteran being in the Army is, is what? One out of, one out of four, one out of five, right? If we include the Coast Guard. And we have a lot of acronyms in the Army that the Air Force don't know and the Air Force and, and vice versa, right? What's a captain in the Air Force, in the Army versus a captain in the Navy? So don't put your rank on there. You, I, you might put your rank on there. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and be, be, 
be cognizant, you know, if you know the company, you've done your research about the company, you know that there's a lot of veterans in the company, you, you know, you, you could put your, you know, tailor your resume towards the company, towards the position at the end of the day. But the biggest thing that I, that I can give you is, is treat it as a casual conversation and not a promotion board. Um, yeah. So one of the things that I see on military resumes that, um, sort of shock me is that someone will say they're a logistics officer and then just sort of believe that everyone understands what a logistics officer is. Or I was a platoon commander, but I have no business skills. Excuse me, if you're a platoon commander, you have got a workforce you have to move, you have supply you have to move, you have a timeline, you have a lot of things that you have to do. So definitely taking some of the military components and try to put the business spin on them because that is one way that you will be able to sort of bridge the gap between yourself and someone who is possibly not former military who will understand that. So we have some questions from the audience. Did you have a question, sir? Uh, yes, I have a couple questions. Uh, do, do cover letters matter and um, things like expensive watermark? paper, and I've heard a tactic where some people will find out who the recruiter is, and they'll FedEx a, a copy directed to that person to get their attention quicker. So I'm going to repeat the questions for um, our video audience. So um, you're looking for opinions from our res uh, from our panelists on cover letters, and also different tactics as far as the kind of paper that the resume is on, and is it hand-delivered? Are those good... Are those good options or not? So, Michael? So a cover letter can can make or break you. If you submit a cover letter, make sure that cover letter talks about, and I'm saying this for a reason, make sure that cover letter talks about that position and that company. Um, I have seen a lot of cover letters talk about positions that have nothing to do with the position that that person just applied to. Believe it or not, I see it a lot. So make, if you do write a well-written cover letter, um, it can it can make you. Just the other day, my one of my hiring managers yesterday, one of my hiring managers said, "You know this this person is we're hiring for a systems engineer, and this person has seven years of systems administration experience. So based off her resume, she's really not an engineer. But man, she wrote a really awesome cover letter. I'm gonna talk to her." So it can make it can it can make you or break you. Um, I I don't want if you are going to an interview, I would suggest bringing a copy of your resume. If you use the expensive paper, I would I would know I would notice that if somebody handed me handed me that resume. Um, I don't think there's a need to email me a, a copy, uh, or excuse me, uh, mail me a copy of your resume. Um, I like to keep things paperless if, if, all, if at all possible. Um, and even if you were to email, so we're a federal contractor and we're, we have to obey by the OFCCP. And even if you, if you did email me, mail me that copy or email me a copy of your resume, I would still have to have you apply for, for all of our positions that you would be interested in and submit a formal application. So, yeah. But during the interview, th yeah, that would be a perfect time to hand that nice piece of copy, piece of paper to the interviewer. Yeah. Um, on the cover letters, I'd say most of the ones that I see if I could summarize it, it would be, I think I'm awesome and I want your job. You know, it doesn't, it's not tailored as he said. Um, I don't, I don't need a cover letter typically because I, I would just rather somebody tailor their resume to the job. But if you do a cover letter, um, you could, um, I like to, I like to do it in my mind. Like if you took the job description, you know, they got the bullets of the job description. Maybe you don't do it for every single bullet. But if you write to those bullets that you see, like I see that you are transitioning from VMware 5.5 to 6.5. Well, I actually led that in my last job. And that's a, that's a pretty awesome thing that you could include in your cover letter. And it, it would also be on your resume probably. So that's why I don't know that you necessarily need to have one. But that's what a cover letter should look like. Um, I also go paperless. I don't, I don't want anything in the mail. Um, I definitely don't want watermark. I would probably pity somebody who used a watermark fancy piece of paper. But that's. Greg, any thoughts on this? 
Uh, I kind of agree. I, I don't like don't send me watermark. I, I mean, it's cool. I mean, it'll generate conversation, I guess, about you, and that it's kind of silly. I mean, but that's not that's not something that's gonna that's gonna make or break you. I mean, if you're that close to the line, I mean, you should have studied more. Um, uh, um, cover letters are nice because it's, it's additional background that we have that we can set aside that we can read more about you before you show up. Um, I do, I do, I do like that. Um, but um, and yeah, if you and if you can tailor it to, to our requirements, that's perfection. It really is. Um, but this is you know, 2019. I don't need a 1970s style you know interview process where we have a physical object you give me. I mean, I have it on the screen. It's fine. So I'm just going to have our panelists summarize, you know, is there one more parting thought that you didn't get to cover in this panel that you want our audience to know? Michael? I would say speaking to the, the veterans about how to write a resume, you already, believe it or not, veterans, you already have all the information that you need to write the resume. You can look at the awards that you were given, look at your, your counseling statements if you were lower enlisted, your NCOERs, your OERs, all that information. Just civilianize it and change those acronyms to, to you know, spell out the acronyms, but it, it, you've already got all that information that you need and just put it on your resume. Um. Yeah, so, um, I mentioned this earlier, there's there's probably more than two ways, but there's two main ways that I'll recruit. And one is I post jobs waiting for people to apply. But then the other is I'm actually headhunting. I'm looking for you on different tools that I have. So you guys get the application thing. But in terms of being found by somebody like me for a job that maybe you're not currently looking, but you just want to post your job somewhere, um, not all recruiters have the same tools. So... Some people are going to have a monster subscription. Some people are going to have a die subscription. Um, I think it would behoove you to put your resume on multiple sources. And that way, if I only have one, I will find you. Uh, but if you only list it in one place, then I'm not going to be able to find you if I don't have that tool. Uh, my biggest tip I could offer recruiters is, um, or I'm sorry, uh, candidates would be to um, fundamentally set up a home lab Second best thing you could do is set up a home lab. The third best thing you can do is set up a home lab. Set up a home lab at home and do the job at home. And then tell me you can do the job at home and then I can talk about the job you do at home. And it's, it translates very well. It really does. Um, set up a home lab. <laughs> to so have a home lab. So let's, let's thank our panelists for their time this morning. And thank you to B-Site San Antonio for allowing me to have the career track. I'm, as I said earlier, I think it's wonderful that the community is really embracing the other aspects of our lives, career search, and also the mental health village that's on the other side. We, we are all involved in this community, and we all need the support. So thank you, B-Site San Antonio, for providing all this. Next up is Megan Modi. No, I don't know. I apologize. Next up is Roxy. Roxy. I'm sorry. Roxy's up next at 11 o'clock. Thank you.